Good afternoon and welcome to worship at Atherton Place. Those of you who are seeing this on Facebook or YouTube or on the closed circuit television at Atherton Place need to know that this ministry is made possible because of the contributions of the pastors and staff and technicians of Stonebridge Church, our neighbor down the street. By the way, if you're looking for a good church, this is a good one. It's at the corner of Kennesaw Avenue and Tower Road, 675 Tower Road. This is the second in the series, uh, Christmas series. Last week we looked at the Bible answer to why did shepherds come. This Lord's Day, we're considering the question, why did wise men come? And I'm reading from the uh, King James Version this week. That may not be the version on the screen, but it's a traditional person. And at 82 years old, I'm pretty traditional. Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where this Christ was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is written in, by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time that star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, so that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warm, warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. And then I want to read a part of the prophecy of this that is found in the book of Psalms, chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. Listen to this. This was written probably 700 years before the event took place in Bethlehem. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Pray with me, please, before I preach. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. And especially in this happy, holy season, we thank you that we can celebrate the greatest event in the human history, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem of Judea. Give me grace to rightly interpret and apply your word. Give your people grace to hear you through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. How does one determine wisdom? Is wisdom the result of education or of maturity? Is wisdom a gift some are born with or can it be acquired? 
Is wisdom the ability to remember many facts and figures, or is it the ability to reason? Is wisdom the vast accumulation of knowledge, or is it a storehouse of common sense? What do you think? In the narrative of the birth of our Lord by the evangelist Matthew, we are not told about the shepherds or the angelic host, but we are ever in Matthew's debt because of his account of the visit of the wise men. Historically, Matthew tells us very little about these men. We don't know who they were. We don't know exactly where they were from. We don't know exactly how they got to Bethlehem. We only know that they came from the east following a star. We know that they brought precious gifts. We know that they worshiped the Christ child. And we know that they went home another way. That's all we know, but maybe that's all we need to know. At least we know the most important fact of all. They were wise men. Why were they wise? And why did these wise men come? Consider first that to set one's eyes on God's star and follow that star no matter what is wisdom. The wise men got to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem by following the star that they were convinced God had put there in order to guide them. This was no ordinary star. To them, it was a beacon of God, a beacon beckoning beckoning them to follow. And they set their eyes on God's star, and in faith, they followed. This is the way of those who are wise. Many others must have seen that star, but only these three men followed it. They followed the star because they believed it to be a sign from God. Wise men follow the star of God no matter where it leads. This was for the star of God always leads us to the place where God wants us to go and wants us to be. Women and men of faith know that God always shows us the way. The problem with so many of us is that we will not follow. God gives everyone some kind of star to guide us, but only those who follow God's star have true wisdom. The shepherd boy, David, knew that it was a wise choice to follow the way that God leads. In his most memorable psalm, the 23rd, David tells us how the Lord always leads his children beside still waters in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The wise person knows that God always leads us to where he wants us to be, and where God wants us to be is where we should desire to be. Too many don't set their eyes on God's star. That is, they have no noble aims, no lofty goals, no high purposes in life. And even if we... we, know of high aims in life, we're not willing to follow the star of God in order to get there. As a result, we don't know where we're going. We're just on our way somewhere. Like Alice in Wonderland. You remember that story? How Alice asked the Cheshire cat, would you tell me please which way I'll go from here? And the cat answered, That depends a great deal on where you want to go. Oh, I don't much care, Alice replied. Then said the cat, it doesn't matter 
much which way you go. But, insisted Alice, I want to get somewhere. Oh, he answered, you're sure to do that. You'll get somewhere, but you may not get to the way, place where you want to go. You may not get to the place where God wants you to go. The truth is we're all going somewhere, but too many of our somewheres end up being anywheres or nowheres. The only way to avoid that kind of uselessness is to get our eyes focused on God's star and follow it faithfully no matter what. That's what the wise men did. That's what wise people still do. Consider, second, that to recognize greatness despite outward appearances is wisdom. To recognize greatness despite outward appearances is wisdom. It was a wise man who once said, things aren't always what they appear to be. Think for a moment about these men. They had made a long journey. They were convinced that the star betokened the birth of a king. So naturally, they went to Jerusalem, the capital city. This is where the king lived. Wasn't that where a new king would be expected to be born? But the star led them not to Jerusalem, but to Bethlehem, a small village of no special importance. To be sure, King David had been born in Bethlehem, so maybe a new king, a king out of David's line, could be expected to be born there too. Yet where in Bethlehem? Anywhere but in a common, smelly stable. But that is exactly where the star guided them. A king born in a common stable. Who could believe it? These wise men believed it. They recognized greatness despite the outward appearances. Greatness, after all, is not the product of outward circumstances so much as it is what a person does in the midst of those circumstances. The greatness of the birth of Jesus is that he was born, not that he was born in a stable. The glory of Jesus is that he was a Christ, the Son of the living God, the promised Messiah, not that his birth was in humble surroundings. And his birth there in that common stable gave nobility to that place. Too often we are deceived by outward appearances. Not so those who are truly wise. The wise see things as they really are, not as they appear to be. Jesus never really appeared to be a kingly man, born in a stable, taken by his parents into exile in Egypt, apprenticed as a carpenter, sleeping under the stars, riding on a donkey, crucified on a cross. These do not appear to be the biographical data of royalty. Do they? But while he may not have appeared to be a king, the Lord Jesus Christ was through and through a king. Yes, he was the king of kings. The wise men recognized this. King Herod didn't. The high priest didn't. Governor Pontius Pilate didn't. Wise men and women recognized True greatness. Listen to how the poet expressed it as he compared Jesus the Christ to Alexander the Great. Jesus and Alexander died at 33. One lived and died for self. The other died for you and me. The Greek died on a throne. The Jew died on a cross. One's life a triumph seemed 
the other but a lost. One led vast armies forth, the other walked alone. One shed a whole world's blood, the other gave his own. One won the world in life and lost the world in death. The other lost his life in order to win the whole world's faith. Jesus and Alexander died at 33. One died in battle and one on Calvary. One gained all for himself and one himself gave all. One conquered every throne, the other conquered every grave. The one made himself God and God made himself less. The one lived but to blast the other but to bless. When died the Greek, forever fell his throne of swords. But Jesus died to live forever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Things are not always as they appear to be. Greatness is not determined by outward appearances. That's what the wise men knew. That's what wise people still know. Consider third, to worship true deity instead of demigods is wisdom. To worship true deity instead of demigods is wisdom. Now, we all know what a demigod is. A demigod is a false god. It is something or someone we treat like a god but which is, in fact, not a god. The wise men, we're told, did not worship King Herod, a demigod, if there ever was one. Neither did they worship the star, though the star seemed to have amazing attributes. What they did worship was Jesus, this little baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Here they found true deity, and when they did, they worshipped. They would not be satisfied by obeisance to the demigods that lured them along the way. They would not worship anyone or anything save true deity. That's wisdom. Too many people give our worship too casually too easily to the demigods of our world. Politicians, physicians, scientists, technologists, philosophers, pastors, those who hold and exert power and influence and knowledge. Some of these are demigods that foolish people worship. Others worship theory, philosophy, discovery, adventure, pleasure and success, Demigods as well. Yet to them, we often bow our heads and bend our knees. And such worship is the height of foolishness. Friends, false worship is not just a slur against God. False worship is also a reflection of our own shallowness and our own ignorance. Not to be fooled by the demigods of this world, no matter how persuasive and alluring they may be, no matter how amazing their powers, that is true wisdom. For demigods always leave us in the lurch. Cardinal Worlesy founds this out. He made himself a worshiper, King Henry VIII, a demigod. But the king abandoned him. And he cried out in sudden realization of his folly at the end, Had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in my old age have left me naked to my enemies. The wise men did not wait until too late to find this out. They worshiped true deity instead of demigods, wise people. Still do. Consider fourth, 
that to give the best we have because we have given ourselves is wisdom. To give the best we have because we have given ourselves is wisdom. The gospel tells us when the wise men saw the child, they fell down and worshipped. By their worship, they gave themselves. That's what worship is. Worship is the giving of our very selves to that which we adore. And then they gave the newborn king gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. These were the finest gifts that they could give, but only because they had first given themselves then naturally they wanted to give the best that they could give. The Christian understanding of giving stems from this basic philosophy. We give ourselves first, and then the giving of our best naturally follows. In writing to the church at Corinth, Paul gave testimony to this, he explains generosity to the, of the generosity of the Macedonian Christians by saying, first, they gave themselves. First, they gave themselves. Generosity, liberality, charity always follows a total commitment of oneself. Where there is no giving of one's best, it is certain that there has been no giving of oneself. There's a phrase that I like, though I have no idea who first uttered it. It exhorts us to give the best that we have to the highest that we know. May I repeat that? To give the best that we have to the highest that we know. That's exactly what the wise men did. And though it all, although it may be in terms of time and talent and influence as well as treasure, the gift of the best we have to the highest that we know is a hallmark of genuine wisdom. A story that I love tells of the man who came out of the office building one day and walked to his car, which was parked at the curb. He noticed a young boy standing there holding the hand of a smaller boy admiring his car, which was brand new. He asked the boy, how do you like that new car, son? The boy said excitedly, that's the most beautiful car I've ever seen. Is that your car, mister? The man said, yes. Mister, how much does a new car like that cost? The man answered, to tell you the truth, son, I don't know. You mean you got a brand new car like that and you don't even know how much it costs? The man explained, you see, son, my brother gave me this new car. The little boy turned to his younger brother and spoke these words, Jimmy, you see this fine new car? This man's brother gave it to him. And someday, Jimmy, I'm going to give you one just like it. Good news, good news, good news. That's giving the best we have because we have given ourselves. That's what the wise men did. And if you and I are wise, we will do it too. Pray with me. Father, we thank you that you gave your best, when you gave Jesus to us to come to earth to live a perfect life, to die a sacrificial death, to purchase by his death and in his blood our forgiveness and everlasting life which he offers to us as a free gift. Father, if there's anyone listening to this message today who has never received that pre free gift, I pray that just now they will invite the Lord Jesus who was born in that stable in Bethlehem to be born in their heart, to come and live in them, to take away their guilt and sin and give them a brand new life 
in this world and a whole new life that goes on into all eternity. I ask this in the Savior's name. Amen. Well, I hope you'll have a happy Christ Christmas and welcome in your heart afresh and anew the Christ child, Jesus Christ our Lord. And I hope you'll be with us in worship next Lord's Day, which will be the day after Christmas, when I'll seek to answer the Bible question, why did Jesus come? Why did shepherds come? Why did wise men come? Why did Jesus come? God bless you.